welcome to this second pod podcast of this uh, National Maritime Day week uh, podcast celebration. I'm Father Sinclair Rue, and I want to welcome you here to the Port Arthur Seafarer Center where we are doing these podcasts in celebration of National Maritime Week. Because of the pandemic, it's not possible for us to do our traditional maritime training, which our maritime celebration, which would have taken place on Friday, May 22nd at the Port Arthur International Seafair, uh, Siemens Memorial Sundial and then laying a wreath in the intercoastal canal. So in place of that, what we have is these uh, five podcasts. Yesterday, we were blessed to have uh, Catherine, uh, Captain Chris Horner join us as well as Kevin Sykes. Uh, Kevin's from the Seafarers International Union and Chris Horner is from Mars State College Orange. And they, they talked about the trainings that are available in the unlicensed section for young people that are our Southeast Texas community. But one of the great assets that we have here in Southeast Texas, especially in the southern reaches of the Sabine Nature's Waterway, are our uh, ports and uh, are our public ports. And with me today are the, di the director of our three uh, public ports in the southern reaches of the Sabine Nature's Waterway. And that is Larry Kelly, who is the director of the Port of Port, of Port Arthur, Lori Taylor, who is the director for the Port of Orange, as well as Mick Coward, right to my left, uh, who is the director for the Port of Orange, and, uh, excuse me, the Port of Sabine Pass. I was doing real well there for a second, but from the, the Port of Sabine Pass. And what I hope to do today is to share some of the re tremendous resources that we have here in our local port community and share them with you so that you'll have a better understanding of, of the great assets. One of the one of the wonderful things that we hold to is that we are the third largest maritime center by tonnage in the United States, and that puts us right behind Long, uh, Los Angeles, Long Beach, as well as uh, the Port of Houston. Uh, but we are leading the nation in a number of different targets that are here also. So we're really proud about that. So let me just let me just start. Uh, we're going to start from the smallest and go to the largest in this case. And so I want to. Uh, turn to Mick and say, well, Mick, Mick thanks for uh, uh, the work that you're doing at the Port of Sabine Pass. I was a pastor down at St. Paul's Catholic Church at Sabine Pass from like 2001 to, to 2008 right. when Hurricane Ike decided that we didn't need a mission right. in Sabine Pass. But it was sort of a sleepy port. Uh, maybe some recreational vehicles. In fact, we had a guy who was living on a sail sailboat that would come yeah. to Mass occasionally. Maybe some fishermen, but not really a lot going on there since literally 1898 when Arthur Stilwell built a canal up to, <laughs> to what is now the uh, the the uh, habitat, habitats here right. in Port Arthur. So what's been going on at the Port of City Pass? What you guys? Think? Thanks, thanks for having me here. I appreciate that. Uh, yes, we are the smallest. We're the first port that you come to. As you enter in the Sabine Nexus Waterway from the Gulf of Mexico. You're also the oldest of it. We, we are. But we uh, we provide a, a unique service to our big brothers to the to the north of us. Uh, one, uh, on our port side, we are uh, accommodating vessels that serve the, uh, the ships that are at Anchorage offshore. We supply that. We provide uh, docking space and fuel for them so that they'll have a good, safe mooring spot for them to go out and service the offshore vessels as they're anchored to come up uh, to the other ports north of us. Uh, so we provide that service also for the shrimping industry. Uh, we're home based to a large number of shrimping fleets. Uh, Dustin Gulf Seafood, who's about 20 vessels, we have them. And then we have another about another 15 vessels that also, so about 35 vessels we support. There. And then also Kim and Sons, just a little bit north of us, we provide services to them as far as uh, docking, fueling services through Rilla Down Marine, who also provides uh, fueling services for, for a large fleet that runs and utilizes the Sabine Nature's Waterway. Uh, what we've got coming up is to actually increase our dock space. All our dock space right now is leased. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working with the Corps right now on permitting for another 400 foot dock space, which will really broaden our capabilities. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of development going on with the LNG industry right now. They've approached us about providing some docking space for barges mm. and some other vessels. So we're working to find a niche to support that growth as well and continue to be a full service port in the Sabine Nature's Waterway area. We're, we're doing, I think we're doing a good job of that. And now, you guys have traditionally, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
traditionally have slips. And so when you're speaking of docks, are you just are like a traditional port dock of so many uh, hundred linear feet with bollards and everything to tie directly? Yes, on? yes, we are. We are. We are looking at our new construction to be of that typical type. Uh, right now, we're trying to recruit the barging companies. We think there's there's an opportunity there to support the industry and also provide a good revenue stream from a different class of customer. Uh, but typically, we have had the, uh, the docking space for individual vessels such as the shrimp boats. But these larger work boats that are coming and some of the supply vessels that are wanting to serve the offshore anchorages, uh, they're needing a different type of facility. So we're wanting to construct that. And that'll kind of change the way that we operate with uh, some more SAC ratings that we've not been able to work with to comply with Coast Guard rules and regulations and things like that. But you also mentioned uh, the recreational side. We also uh, were a two two pronged business, the port and the marina. And the marina section has continued to grow. And when I came on board, that was kind of the, uh, the low hanging fruit, if you would. I didn't need to gain permitting to do all that kind of work. But we've had, we've added about uh, 1.5 million worth of assets to the recreational marine side, and that has really taken off. Uh, just here this last two months during this COVID-19 pandemic. We've actually added eight new customers on the recreation side. So we're seeing an uptick of that, which is good news. And we think that's going to continue to, to uh, progress and continue to develop as a good, good business. Also, it does support industry in a way for their employees to have a place to come and recreate. So we're seeing interest from that. Ms. Ackley's effect was already those guys are coming on board. We're seeing some of their project managers bringing their boats out to have recreation and things like that. So. That's going very well for us, and uh, we look for that continue, continue to grow. Now, when you talk about the, the the new dock, are you are you gonna are you looking to place that along the port of ship channel, or are you planning to dredge that in that inland and build it there? It actually will be a connection to the existing dock. We'll come out about 65 feet, and then we'll go 400 foot linear foot paralleling the ship channel. Uh, we're still going to be a shallow draft port. We're not going to we're not going to dredge out to the channel to accommodate a larger vessel. So we're still going to be in that maximum depth range of about 16 feet, mm -hmm. which for the most part accommodates all the type of vessels that we think that we can provide, provide that we can provide services to. Uh, hopefully, we'll, in, the, in the long term future, we're working with some other uh, developers and investors of some other properties down south of us. And hopefully one, one day we'll have a deep water port in Sabine Pass. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's long range to try for us to facilitate that and uh, promote that. So we're working with other partners to develop other port facilities, maybe downstream of us in, in, the, in the longer future. Yeah, it really, it, being that one of the first ports in the state of Texas was chartered and Sabine Pass was chartered like in 1838 or something. So, yes, really so. Something, and, and it was the deep water port the most northern deep water port in Texas until Arthur Stilwell came and then dredged up to this point, and then the ships were able to come up a little further, and then eventually dredging up to the port of Beaumont, which then cut down on the transportation, land transportation costs. Of exactly, and that's, you know, there's a long history, as you mentioned, of the port facilities in the Spring Pass area. And it's just that as, as the needs progressed, and of course the vision that Arthur Stilwell had of moving things upstream, and other ports upstream have been extremely successful. And I think you mentioned the tonnage earlier in your conversation about where we're ranking nationally. And that's a lot of kudos to, to Larry and Laurie and of course to the port there in Beaumont. But uh, we, we clearly can fit a niche. And as this traffic continues to grow, I know our pilots are really interested in finding some other solutions, maybe downstream to help manage that traffic. And we're working to help facilitate that and to work our you know, support the others that want to invest in that to find solutions for them as well. Yeah. And also, I want to shift now over uh, and run up the, uh, go to our most, we were at the most southern part of the south of the nature, Sabine Nature's Waterway. And so I want to go now to the most eastern part of the Sabine Nature's Waterway. Literally, you step across the line and you're in Louisiana at that point. So I want to talk to Lori Taylor, who's with us by phone. Uh, for the Port of Orange. Welcome, Laura. Well, thank you for having me today. I appreciate it. You're welcome. So um, tell me, when was the Port of Orange established and uh, uh, what's some of your history and what are you doing now? The Port of Orange was established in the early 50s. Um, 
we right now we have been uh, right now we have been working uh, with industry to try to diversify the port with our rail. Uh, we currently offer you, you talked about uh, dock space and things like that. We currently offer about 2,300 feet of dock space, and we've got um, 350,000 square feet of uh, dockside warehouses. We've been working with the rail and several uh, potential uh, clients about getting our rail back up and running. We, it hasn't been in, in use, but we are, have been identifying uh, repairs that need to be made. Um, and we're hoping to get that bid out in the near future so we can get our rail up and running. Um, we've also been working on um, developing uh, 13 acres of greenfield area that runs, uh, it's waterside greenfield area that runs uh, parallel to the slip and uh, for like a potential lay down area for offloading a cargo. So we've been approached by multiple people about using that site. Um, as far as, we do complement the other larger ports, the Port of Port Arthur and the Port of Beaumont, because uh, we offer uh, labor services to ships and we don't have a minimum or a maximum when they come in. Uh, we actually, during the pandemic, a lot of the um, ships didn't, you know, they didn't have jobs, they didn't have cargo oil prices were down. And so we actually saw some record numbers here at the port for, uh, we were completely full and had a waiting list for people that were wanting to come in to lay up during the pandemic time. Um, so we've been working with them. We've also established several new customers during this time, people that have reached out to us and we're hoping that that'll be a long-term uh, long relationship with them. We so offer shore power service here um, and uh, water, potable water when they come in. And again, we don't have a minimum or a maximum. We've had them stay as long as a year in some mm -hmm. cases in the past. Yes. So how are, are you full now or some of the ships that had laid up, have they gone back to work? We're not. Um, one of the ships went back to work and then uh, we had a barge and a tug um, that was sold. The barge uh, left this, this past weekend. The tug is still here. And then the other ships are still here and barges. Yeah. Now, do you, do you see in the future going back to some historical point, there was a lot of bad cargo, uh, PL-480 stuff, uh, food aid programs that used to ship out years ago from Orange. Do you see Orange going back into that type of cargo handling, or are you going to be moving into other things like short sea shipping or uh, other niche markets? Um, we, we have some potential expansion that's coming to the orange area that's uh, relatively close. It'll be within five miles of the port. And so I potentially see us um, getting into um, maybe some cargo related to that industry. Um, right now, we're just serving as a niche market. Um, as far as the type of um, cargo that you talked about in the past, I don't know if we'll get back into that like we used to be, but um, we'll just have to see what the future holds. We're hoping that between the rail, uh, you know, the upgrades that we're going to make to the rail, and also we've been making some upgrades to both our docks and our warehouses on the docks. Um, uh, we're, we've been working on that with our engineers. We're hoping um, to see an uptick uh, in the cargo movement over here and, and potential lay down areas over here because right now the port has. 50 plus acres of green field that can be developed uh, for the future and um, we're hoping I'm hoping to work with um, different customers that approached me to hopefully develop that for their needs. Yeah there's there's a lot of potential that that lies there. Uh, I know being the pastor of St. Francis in Orange, Texas, uh, we certainly know that what Conoco Phillips has or Chevron Phillips excuse me has uh, has that large chemical plant that uh, is in, anticipated. And we'll come to the Port of Port Arthur soon, but Motiva, when they did their, uh, their what was it, $9, $6 billion, $10, $9 billion expansion of their program, uh, the Port of Port Arthur became an essential area of transferring and then bringing in large vessels. Could the Port of Orange be used as that, that capacity if this thing eventually, if uh, Chevron Phillips pulls the trigger on their project. Yes, we could be used. We could be used with our barges and also with our rail. I know a lot of, a lot of things are going to be coming in by rail. Also, um, we we're not as deep as Port Arthur right now. We are restricted to a 23 foot draft. Uh, we're federally authorized up to 30 feet, 
but due to some shoaling that's further up at the intersection of the Natchez and the Sabine, uh, we are restricted right now to 23 feet, but we are hoping to um, to maybe handle uh, some of the uh, cargo that comes in to complement the expansion that's going to be done here in Orange. Is there, I know there's been a whole lot of discussion of deepen of the deepening project uh, that runs from uh, offshore all the way up to the Port of Beaumont. Is there going to be any work in that project to uh, to bring uh, the Port of Orange or, and the waterway up to Orange back down to 30 feet? Uh, not in the not in the project that you're referring to, but the port is working with the core and potentially doing something in the future in this problem area. It would be a separate project though. Yep, yep. Well let me let me uh, turn down the guy the man in the middle. Uh we've gone down to the southern part and then we've gone to the eastern part, but before you as you're traveling from uh, Mick's port to Laurie's port, you pass Larry's port. So Larry, uh Welcome to this uh, second podcast for celebrating National Maritime Week. And uh, what's going on at the Port of Port Arthur, and what are some of your plans over there? Well, first, Father, I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to participate, and I'll find some way to get even with you later. Uh, <laughs> this is a, I'm a frequent podcast listener, listener. I will tell you this is the first time in the history of my life I've ever I've been on a podcast, so, uh, you know, don't set your expectations very high for me. Uh, I, I will say it's a great, it's a great day. Uh, we live in a very vibrant community that's a, a maritime community that I think often goes uh, unseen. And, and I'll add, I think that the ports, uh, and they've all been mentioned, of uh, our friends at Sabine Pass and Orange and Beaumont, they complement each other. It's not really so much a question of, uh, which one has more tonnage or anything like that we all do a different job and uh the adage that it's popular in our trade association is if you've seen one port you've seen one port and we all have our own niches and we all play a very important role in in our state regional and national economies and and i'll tell you right now port port author is very busy um we handle a significant volume of imported eucalyptus pulp from south america uh popularized by uh uh, it's turned into making uh, Viva, Charmin, Bounty, Cottonelle, so toilet paper, Kleenex, paper towels. I'm here to tell you, and anybody that's listening, that there's an adequate supply. It's just consumer demand <laughs> is what stretched the process. Uh, aside from that, we also handle a significant volume of military activity and energy. And, and Father, you pointed out about our uh, uh, diesel exports that are tied to a local refiner. Uh, and so it rounds out that the port's kind of like a little Swiss army knife. In the grand scheme of things, we're a relatively small port. But uh, one of the things that I would be remiss to say, and the uh, inclusion of Sabine Pass and Orange, and, and, and humbly I appreciate you including Port Port Author, is that we're all in a common service area for the Port Author National Seafarer Center, which is located next door to the port. And I just, I want to say hats off to you and, and Doreen, I know she's off camera right now, and the entire staff of what goes on that helps make these ports a success. And right now the merch, retail merchants are closed or they're disrupted, but there's not a day that the, a van is not taking one to a, a Best Buy or, or to uh, um, some other store and they're dropping coins in our community and it has a much greater impact on the seafarers in our community uh, that. They're obviously the seafare, seafare Center serves a higher calling than just going to um, Academy or, or Best Buy, but uh, the relationship that we've got and the importance of that Seafair Center in our community is part of the magic or part of the uh, the key ingredients that makes a, a local port a success. And I, I, I really appreciate your time and just wanted to kind of point out those couple of things. As far as the uh, future of the port, we have a relatively large construction expansion going on. If you're near the port probably right now you may hear some pile driving uh i apologize for the noise but it sounds like music to me and it's part of a uh, a 40 million dollar uh 600 foot dock expansion and behind that there's a 55 million dollar 1000 linear foot expansion that's uh, happening here at the port so father i'd be glad to answer any questions but the key takeaways are for me is the importance of all the ports in our community and the importance of the seafair center uh, that helps what that is help that is what helps make this community a, a great maritime success. 
one of the, and uh, I've said frequently that growing up here in Port Arthur, watching the ships literally sail past Ninth Avenue and Memorial Boulevard as they're coming down the Intercoastal Canal, heading uh, up to either the Natchez River, Port of Orange, or the Port of Beaumont as a kid, it absolutely astounds me that in the mentality of so many people in the local community, we could just as well be in Colorado. <laughs> And and if it's not if it's not one of the refinery or the chemical plants, then there's sort of this absence about the economic impact of what's going on. And I'd just like to sort of circle around to all three of you and ask you, not talking about the, the longshoremen who are working a ship, because they come and they go as the ship comes, but as far as the permanent people who are working at your facility uh, day in and day out, whether it's the, the warehouse guys or the office people that are there. How many people actually are working for your different ports? Because when you begin to add this all together, and not, not speaking of expanding it out to the dozens of ILA longshoremen who will be working a ship at the Port of Port Arthur, but rather we've got quite a little industry here of, of employment that is also feeding our local community. Mick, so how many people are working at Speed Pass? Well, we have eight permanent employees that are four more staff. We have an additional, uh, of course, on the fueling side, we have an additional four on the fueling side that, that support us. But also on the construction side, we clearly almost always have some type of activity at the port doing maintenance or doing construction. So we're supporting those crafts, whether it's the electrical, the steel guys, or, or that. Uh, also, just from a delivery perspective, the number of trucks that come into our port. I mean, we're right now, I think we're averaging around 500 fuel trucks annually, uh, with another about 250 other types of trucks that come through our gate. So there's a lot of activity of that that helps support economic uh, growth in our area. Uh, and again, looking at just the recreational side, the marina side, I mean, that's another activity that we have just from a recreational perspective uh, for supporting the economy in this area. Our small stores are being passed. Smell uh, sells a lot of things mm -hmm. uh, from fishing tackle, crappy supplies, other things that people want to use when they go out and recreate. So we're we're part of that whole economic <laughs> chain, uh, both the port side and the marina side as well. Laurie, over there in the Port of Orange, how many people you got working for you there? Well, when you include our full-time employees that we have, and all of our contractors that come in and out, and we also have two. Uh, small uh, shipyard repair facilities here that are tenants at the port. And with all of our existing, excuse me, existing tenants, we probably have between two and 300 people. 200, 300 people. Working here yeah. at the port. Mm -hmm. And Larry, how, how about you? You're looking at 5% of the staff right now. Um, no, <laughs> and, and, and I'd say that number is comparable to what Laurie's talking about. If you look at the seafood in, processing industry that's here, uh, the support role with rail, and you did mention longshore labor on any given day, it'd be 50 to 150 longshoremen here working. Um, uh, and then if you look at the the invisible part of our staff, of all the, the consultants and support, be it attorneys or insurance or engineers and the like, um, that's easily attain that number. And when we do economic impact statements, we take those things into consideration and it's quite easily the direct impact is several hundred jobs, and then the indirect impact is several thousand jobs. Um, tr true in our community, and, and I'll tell you, uh, 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 talking about uh, uh, down at, uh, Mick talking about down at Sabine Pass, that is a very important part, because we do not have that resource here in Port Arthur necessarily for recreational fishing. We're on a co-located section of the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway and the Deep Sea Channel, it's a little bit like playing on the side of an interstate. So it just it just doesn't fit. And that's why I think it's so important uh, the way our community kind of comes together. All the ports have a little something different to offer and you put it all into that gumbo, Father, and it comes out pretty good at the end of the day. Yeah, and when you look at this, all of a sudden you bring it all together into one place as opposed to being dispersed in four deep water ports, including the Port of Beaumont, that you know, you've got a couple of people here, a couple of people there, a couple of dozen people here, but all of a sudden you begin to look at a situation that begins to be equivalent to our hospital, a hospital or one of our medium sized uh, petrochemical facilities, if not larger, when they all sort of come together. And, and, and you realize all, 
that this has a impact. I've, I've also said, often said as the court chaplain, Catholic court chaplain, uh, in, in sometimes in frustration, that since the seafarers are spread out on Sunday, and you would have 10 on this ship, 10 on that ship, 15 on this ship, something like that, as far as Catholic seafarers, that if we ever put them in one place, we'd call it a mission and assign a priest to it. But since they're dispersed, we don't, we can't really focus on that. But when we begin to think about the Port of Sabine Passport, Port Arthur, Port of Orange, Port of Beaumont, and we bring them together as a collective group and realize the economic impact that they are having. Larry, just to the wood chip issue, how many trucks do you have coming through the port every day to bring, to, to supply the wood chip program? Oh, there, that's about uh, one ever 15 or 20 minutes. So you wind up with um, 40 or so a day. And then on the forest products export, um, you'll probably see another 50 to 60 a day. Uh, it's it's every day we're closer to 150 to 200 trucks a day in and out of here. Absolutely. So my final question, I'm going to go around to each of you. If If I was a genie and you had one wish that you could make, what would you want that wish to be for your port? Laurie, let me start with you. I would really like to see us fully develop all of the, the greenfield area that we have because I think it would be, it would complement um, the other uh, ports in the area as well as the industry in the area. I think there's a lot of potential here. Um, obviously that requires um, a lot of thought and consideration and working with um, you know investors and clients needs. And I would also like to see our rail completely up and running and diversified. We have a probably about 13 acres that I could see uh, being a potential rail area dedicated to only rail that would complement our uh, facilities at our docks. And I would like to see that developed. So between those two, uh, that, that would be my wish. Nick, what would you like? I think kind of similar to what Lori just said, I think for us, there's there's so much potential that we, we keep putting up on our board of pain. We see all this opportunity that's, that just seems to be within reach, and we're not able right now to connect all the dots. But I think the vision that we have of continuing to acquire other properties that make us one continuous uh, section of the waterfront, not to be the deep water port, but to continue to provide services that will help industry continue to grow. But again, the potential that we have for Southeast Texas that's related to port activity and commerce is just, every time we look at it, it just gets bigger. The potential gets bigger and bigger. And for us to continue to find and be smart enough to connect those dots, I think we have that opportunity. It's just a matter of, of getting everybody together, poor together, our engineering team together, and of course, the financial structure of it. I think if, to, to answer that wish would be to be successful on accomplishing all that we see that we can do. Now, we would have a lot of potential. It, would you have to do bond issues into the community, the Port Arthur, the community of City Pass? Or? Yes, sir. We just we have a bond out that we haven't completely spent all of the bond money, the revenue from that bond money. So we have some funding, plus also with our. Uh, pilot agreements with the LNG industry. We have good cash flow from that perspective, and we want to build that business model to take advantage of that and become self-sufficient from a business perspective as well. And Larry, so over there at the Port of Port Arthur, you get the last word. If I was a genie, what would you wish for? You know what? It's already been stated. It's land. Uh, one of the things that we find uh, in Texas and Lori and and, and Mick, to a certain extent, probably has more land than developable land than, than, than we have. And it's something we've been aggressively trying to work to pursue. And one of the things, the way the port was development, developed, if you think about it, and I tell people, one of the best things about our port is we have a rail yard next to us. One of the worst things about our port is we have a rail yard next to us. So it limits <laughs> how we can develop, right? The future development of the port will be shaped like an L or a U or something like that. And so... Uh, these docks that we're building, for every square foot of dock, you need a multiplier probably 100 or 200 times of that. And so, like a lot of U.S. ports, they're located in the middle of the community when there was a day when the longshoremen walked to work or, or something like that. So, we've got a little different set of challenges that we're, we're working on. So, thanks.
Well, I want to thank you guys for being part of this second podcast of National Maritime Day week. And uh, I do want to thank, make a special shout out to, to the Port of Port Author for being the sponsor of this program, as well as I want to thank uh, our, our supporters. And these are organizations in the local maritime community and in Southeast Texas who have said that uh, supporting the program and will be encouraging their members to look, to watch these videos and to, and to support them in every way that they can. And so thanks to the Port of Port Author for being our sponsor, but also I want to thank the Nautical Institute Houston Gulf Branch, the Council of American Master Mariners, their Texas A&M uh, Council, as well as their Houston Council, uh, the uh, Propeller Club of the Ports of the Sabine Nate and Natchez, uh, Wright Ships, AOS Apostleship of the Sea, Diocese of Beaumont, as well as Apostleship of the Sea, USA, and also the West Gulf Maritime Association. And we couldn't do it without it, but the Port Arthur International Seafair Center that gives us this great meeting room with these wonderful uh, messages from World War II uh, Merchant Marine posters, as well as the American Merchant Marine Veterans uh, flag behind us. So we want to thank you all for being part of this podcast and join us again tomorrow, Wednesday, for podcast number three, when it is Women, Women Wednesday, you could say. It is the day for the women on the water to talk about opportunities and work in the maritime industry, especially uh, at shipping. We've got uh, Captain Augusta Roth from Texas A&M Maritime Academy and Aaron Bertram from the Marine Engineers Beneficiary Association talking about their life careers as mariners and the opportunities that there are present day for women. So join us again tomorrow uh, for our third podcast for Women, Women Wednesday. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Father. Thank you.